everyone, this is Once Bitten 360's Warhammer channel. Uh, I am Once Bitten, and with me is Jerry P. Say hey, Jerry. Hey, guys. Uh, what we're doing here is a 2013 year in review. This is something that, as far as we know, has never really been done before. And uh, Jerry and I wanted to have this video commentary on the news and happenings of the Warhammer Fantasy Battles community. And we thought we'd start by uh, previewing the year that was in 2013. Jerry, do you have anything you want to add to that? Uh, no. Uh, it's a great year. It's been an exciting ride. Uh, there's a lot of things going on in the community and uh, huge things happening at uh, Games Workshop compared to a normal year form. So uh, if this is anything for the future, I think we're all in for a treat. Yeah, absolutely. Well, hey, well, let's start off with a word from one of the, the biggest names in the uh, Warhammer uh, community, and that is uh, Brian, otherwise known as Malorian. Hey there, this is Malorian, and this is my review for Warhammer Fantasy for 2013. Now, really, if you look back, it was a really good year for GW and all of us Warhammer Fantasy players. They had a lot of releases, you know, it seemed like every second month. It was just bam, 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 nether release, nether release, and these were all very high quality books, right? And it's one of these things where when you look through the books, you could try and flip through and say, okay, what's the super combos now? But really, for the most part, other than a few little glaring things, you're really looking like, man, I could run it this way, I could run it this way. So it was almost like a year of options where all of a sudden, like, it was like the dream where all of a sudden the books are completely balanced. And sure, there's a few little units that seem completely useless, but overall, man, there's a lot of good ways to play the game, and it makes it very diverse and very interesting. There's a few small things, say like the Demon Prince, that were kind of like a real sour note, like, oh no, they're almost going back to their old ways. But man, after doing things so right with so many books, Books, it was really a very good year. Um, going forward, I, we already know that we're going to be seeing a couple more books like Dwarves coming up and then Ninth. And so really, this is going to be a big thing where they got to really keep this going. Uh, they have other competitors, say like Privateer Press, which are really starting to catch up with them. So right now, GW across 2013, they ended the year on a very high note and they're just going to keep on doing what they're doing to keep this going and stay up there. Because, I mean, guys like me, I love the game and whenever GW GW is doing great books and producing a way where, man, I mean, I can take my orcs and goblins and do it tons of different ways. You can grab your high elves, do it multiple ways. It's just a great time. It's a golden age. So there's my coverage. Uh, at the FAQ situation from Games Workshop certainly is a big one, at least in our community down here in the southeast uh, United States. Uh, with the frantic pace that they're belting out books like every three months or so, I don't think we've seen one since about April. Right. Um, what's your thoughts? Yeah, no, I agree. As a matter of fact, I think it, it, it got bad enough in our region where we finally put together a committee to develop our own FAQ because there were just there were too many questions that uh, people played differently. And um, I think a lot of people don't necessarily care as much about how the rules are as they do that it's consistent and we all know what rules we are going to play by. Yeah, and I think consistency is the key, uh, particularly um, – uh, around the garage, around the basement, I don't foresee too many people having problems because you can just pick up a dice and toss it and you know figure it out. But uh, especially in the uh, more competitive uh, grand tournaments and uh, events that a lot of us enjoy going to, um, it does present to, to be a problem once in a while. Um, the uh, the contradictions with the uh, leadership and inspiring presence and uh, that old. Uh, bag of tricks has uh, been a thorn in the side that the GW FAQ writers, for whatever reason, just keep contradicting one another. It's almost as if they have a different staff member every time uh, FAQ comes out and the intern gets sent and, you know, something happens. Yeah. Man, they, they used to have a hotline. Do they even have that anymore where you could call up and ask a rules question? Yeah. <laughs> they just had whoever, you know. Yeah, I, I, don't th I don't think they do. And probably, uh, thank God, right? Um, yeah. I think, uh, you know, um, any type of... Uh, uh, customer service representative uh, might even know a little less uh, about Warhammer Fantasy anyway than, uh, say, like 40K, seeing how 40K is the largest game. Um, but uh, touching on that, about trends, Games Workshop anyway, um, what uh, another good point that I think uh, Malorian touched on is uh, the encroaching ninth edition that is rumored to come out this year, or uh, I, well, I guess next year at 2014. Um, do you know if there's any truth behind that rumor, or 
I don't know. It seems to me that the basis of the rumor is that uh, they're, they're on schedule for one. Um, I don't follow rumors tightly, you know, really closely. So it could be that, that they've been uh, verified at some level. But, uh, I mean, certainly we're on track. I mean, we're due for one in 2014. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I'd rather just stick with eighth as long as possible. I think it, it's so much better than seventh was at this stage. Um, you know, we can develop our own FAQs. It, it functions. And when ninth does come out, I, I really, truly hope it's just a tweaking of eighth and not a re redo. Overhaul. Yeah, well, my concern with the, uh, the rumors um, for ninth edition are uh, twofold. Uh, on one hand, uh, apparently the reasoning that GW has been pushing all these eighth edition books out is because they're getting ready to uh, get purchased by a bigger corporation like Hasbro. And, uh, something like that. Uh, Games Workshop has traditionally always been a British uh, company, um, and uh, they only hire from within Britain. So I don't know how much truth is behind that rumor, but you know, money controls all. So, like the old saying goes, I mean, uh, if it's about you know capitalism, then I could see that happening. Um, the other big ninth edition thing that makes me uneasy is the, is uh, what happened in 40k. The entire idea of allies. And um, speaking to uh, some of our other tournament organizers and brethren from across the states, the Northeast, the Midwest, uh, who play 40K. I know neither you or I do. Uh, apparently, the impact it's had so far on that game has uh, splintered the, the community in some sense. Um, basically, uh, people are only taking the best combos, yep. and comp is non-existent in that game system's tournaments. So, um, overall, it's had a, a it's, it had uh, as many people drop from the new edition of Warhammer 40,000 that joined up. And that is a cause of alarm for me because I have a lot of armies. Right, right. Yeah, I, I hear that. I also hear they have a, some kind of new model out that's like unkillable, kills everything. Uh, it's like they just want to sell big, you know. Only, only $250. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, I guess you hit a good point. Um, and... Uh, I guess the final point regarding uh, this topic anyway is uh, Games Workshop and uh, their much-hated pricing policy. Um, I, I, I mean, I know yourself as well as myself were stalwart capitalists. I'm all for, uh, you know, making money if you've got a good product. And uh, by any stretch of the imagination, Games Workshop has the best product on the market. Uh, I was putting together some alternative models to use in an army I just started collecting. And uh, by comparison, the GW plastics these days are wow. You know, um, I mean, they're, they're beautiful uh, in the sense that they hold hide the mold lines. I mean, you know, the, 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 the plastic is firm and durable. It's not this brittle stuff that you'll get from historical manufacturers that will snap. Um, and they've got a lot of things going for it. Now, maybe not stuff like the primer that's 15 bucks, uh, but, you know, they're model wise anyway. They put out a good product. And you know what? The one thing people can't complain about is the quality of the product if they can complain about the price. You know, I agree. I, I think that's mainly true with, with new, um, you know, new things they come out with. I mean, a lot of their old things that they haven't updated in years are still ridiculously priced. And a lot of those are not impressively modeled. Um, I think, for instance, because my son has a dwarf army and um, I recently bought a small dwarf army, the one I bought was from Mantic. And th those models look so much better. They're, they're much less cartoony. They're bigger and brawnier. They, they, you can't put them in the same army because the, the GW dwarfs look wimpy. Uh, well, that could be a matter of perception of, on uh, aesthetic. You know, I mean, um, it could be, like, for example, uh, Manic puts out a good product. They have this new Angel line of uh, warriors. But then again, for every line like the Angels or the dwarves, they have something like the High Elves. Yeah, yeah. Which are horrific. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> you know? Uh, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. But the thing is, I think what GW needs to be careful about is if they want to charge more because they're putting out beautiful models, that's fine, but you can't keep charging more and more for these old school mod models that were designed 15, 20 years ago. And you really can't justify why you need to charge so much for them. They're, you know, any, any cost they had sunk into the creation of it was made back a long time ago. Well, and you bring an important point up because uh, as we're, we're moving into the main topic, the year in review, a lot of the same armies were re-released and a lot of the same models were repackaged, uh, like uh, the Dark Elf Elite Troops that were, you know, like five bucks for however many, or uh, five models for X amount of dollars, you know, now moved up to the uh, infamous Gold Sword prices. 
Um, and uh, they're re-releasing a lot of the models that um, are the same exact model, but just in different packaging and right. the price less that goes with it. So, yeah. yeah. I, I, th I think they're, GW does not need to be cheap, but people need to not feel like they're getting ripped off. And as long as right. the workshop doesn't, they don't, as long as they don't gouge people, you know, I think they could, they could really corner, corner the market, if you will, um, in the sense that they're the game that people follow. They make the army books. People, I think people like to support Games Workshop. They just don't want to feel ripped off by it. Right. And I, I think part of that is just, and part of it is unjust criticism at the same time. Because even War Machines, um, when War Machines first came out in 2006 or 2005, they uh, were the, uh, the manic games of their times. They had great quality models for cheap prices. Um, and you can still get, like, I think, a, a War Machine Battle Force or something for about 30, 40 bucks maybe. Um, but now, any troops that are, uh, I was at my local game store, uh, again, looking at some alternative models, and uh, a unit of, like, five cavalry was $89. Um, and I don't know if it's primarily because they're made out of metal. Um, I don't know if the price of uh, metallics has gone that much up on the global market. But what I do know is... Um, that's similar in pricing to Games Workshop's uh, Blood Knights that they also produce in all metal. So I don't know if, if that's just the direction the industry is going, or maybe that's a, uh, a direction a company gets when it matures and it realizes how much of this luxury product, because that's what it is, how much of this luxury product that they can charge. Um, well, I guess if you want, uh, let's take a break and hear from all of our sponsors, and uh, we'll be back. All right. Welcome back. Well, hey, before we get to the main topic of the show, which is the year in review 2013, um, let's hear from a couple of friends of the channel to see what they have to say. Uh, this is Adam Sinclair from Sheffield, UK, uh, and I'm going to do a quick chat about the UK tournament scene at the moment. Um, basically, uh, I started tournament gaming about just over a year ago now. Uh, my first tournament was Call to War. Uh, Mansfield and it was very much ETC comp and at the time the tournament meta appeared to be a lot of ETC comp. Um, as that's gone and progressed um, it seems to have rapidly changed to me in the last year. Uh, we now went to pool systems kind of like um, Southern Coast uh, and I'd recommend you look that one up. It's a really cool system. It's not updated so it's only accurate when they make it and then they don't update it for the rest of the year. Um, but really, how the system seems to be going now, a lot of the tournaments seem to be going uncomped with scenarios, which appears to be a new thing. Um, it's kind of kick-started by the Bad Dice podcast, I think, anyway, um, when they did Blood and Glory, which was uh, a six-game tournament, 2,400 points, completely uncomped, um, and it, it sort of shattered conceptions and stuff, and really was cool. Uh, running my own tournament in January, very small, low-key thing, um, also on comps with scenarios, and one of the major, major ones, the Sheffield Slaughter, uh, which sold out in like five minutes, 100 plus people, um, that's 2,000 points on um, and it's, it's using scenarios as well, so it seems to be a really big thing uh, that's now in the UK meta, which is really cool to see, because it just shakes things up now that we're getting to the back end of 8th edition. Um, the armies that we're seeing in the UK at the moment, to see if it corresponds to how it is across the pond and in Europe, uh, we're still seeing an awful lot of warriors, demons, and high elves. Um, warriors were dominating the local scene and the and the national scene uh, with the unkillable demon prince and the three up rerollable ward save ones BSB on demonic mounts. Um, Demons, the German ETC list just seemed to spread like wildfire, and after everyone wrote them off initially, um, everyone seems to be using that now. I've tried tried going monocorn myself, and you can see those on my battle reports, to mixed results really. Um, and High Elves still really, really popular, despite the fact that 
they don't really seem to be winning anything. Uh, a guy called Pash, uh, he's got third place at the recent Bjorn Supremacy using Swedish comp. Um, but really, that's like the highest I've seen them uh, at major tournaments, unless one's slipped under my radar. Um, High Elves, I, I, which I play a lot of and you'll find on my channel, um, seem to have a tool for everything, but they just can't fit that all in uh, into one list. So if you know who you're playing, High Elves can be amazing uh, to list build. But if you're taking it to a tournament, you kind of really need to play the meta. And whether this is the same across the pond again, but the UK scene at the moment, uh, it still seems to be a very much a one-up armor save light council meta, um, which is kind of getting a little tired, I have to say. Um, so I'm kind of looking forward to how things, say like the hopefully the upcoming Wood Elves might uh, might change that around. But that's for another time. Hope you've enjoyed this. Bye. Hey guys, Ian here from the Sustainable Center, participating in Once Bitten's Year in Review video, and because it's December, wearing the awesome hat that you must listen to. It's like the hat from Hogwarts, whatever the hell that was. You must listen to everything that comes out of this hat, which today is me. <laughs> so anyway, there's a few topics I want to cover really quick. First of all, uh, the Warhammer YouTubers community. Best year I've seen out of the Wargaming uh, hobby group on YouTube ever. I've been doing this since 2007, off and on. By far the best year I experienced uh, doubling my number of subscribers. I'm sure once bit in Malorian and other channels, you've probably doubled your number of subscribers. So it's been a very successful year for Warhammer YouTubers. Looking forward to 2014, however, I do anticipate a little bit of a plateau here. There are only so many people who play Warhammer Fantasy, and I think this was the year of revelation where everybody found each other's channels and built the community, which is great. However, we are limited to how many people actually play this game, so I don't anticipate to double-digit grow next year just on Warhammer Fantasy. But we're still a very large community in terms of wargaming, and uh, we're really well supportive and communicative with each other in terms of the Google Plus group and, and everything else, so I think we're doing a fantastic job. Uh, switching our gears a little over to YouTube, YouTube's making some really big changes, especially with the way the comments work and the way people get paid and, and copyright infringement and all of that. And all I'm going to say on that without going into too much detail is I think we're going to be okay because we're such a tiny, tiny, tiny group in the scope of what is YouTube where there are millions of subscribers, hundreds of thousands of subscribers. We're just a couple thousand here, you know, with once bitten hovering around 5,000. So, I mean, I, I anticipate most of the stuff just to fly right over the right over the dome here, just like the Mets season, and uh, not even really matter or impact us. The last thing I want to cover really quickly is, is GW. Um, there's been a lot of rumors circulating around, as you know, I read a lot of rumor blogs, and apparently GW is positioning themselves to sell the company. That's why they're moving so quickly with releasing so many books and trying to get, you know, 40K stable and trying to finish up all the books for fantasy and get 9th edition out next year. And quite honestly, I, I, I do believe them that they are going to sell it. Who's going to buy it? Hasbro, maybe. I don't know. Um, but, you know, either way, I really enjoy fantasy. As long as ninth isn't a major pivot on the current rules, as long as it's just kind of a little bit of a pivot, fix a couple things like steadfast and, and spell casting and whatnot, uh, I, I will be very happy to play with ninth edition being the final edition. And uh, as long as Bretonia gets a book, got to get that book, uh, I'll be uh, I'll be happy about that. So I hope you guys enjoyed. Hope once bitten likes it, especially listen to the hat, even though the team doesn't win, like yours truly right here, a bunch of losers. <laughs> but otherwise, hope you guys enjoyed. Hope you guys had a great year. And next year, we'll have the little Anthony on the show as well uh, as my son gets born in March. Take care. Welcome back, everybody, and I guess it's time to get into our main topic, and our main topic is the year in review for 2013 for Warhammer Fantasy Battles from Games Workshop, um, and I guess there's no better place than the start of the year in January. Uh, the January saw the first in a two-part release for uh, quote-unquote chaos with the Warriors of Chaos Army book. Um, the Warriors of Chaos Army book was last released, I believe, in 2009 or, early, or late 2008. And, uh, again, was one of those army books I don't think people think needed to be re-released. Um, the book brought a couple new units, uh, particularly two uh, rare choices, the uh, Slaughter Brute, um, which they released a dual kit for that, and the Mutalith Vortex Beast. Have you seen uh, any one ever used? I've seen one of them in a game store. I, I haven't, I've seen the models used, and I don't know if they were proxy for those models, or if in fact they were being used as those models. In fact, I know uh, one of our clubmates, 
uh, Grail Quest used a Vortex piece, I believe, Ken. Um, but uh, along with that, they've got a whole new range of spell decks, and uh, most interestingly enough for the Words of Chaos players was the return of the Demon Prince, um, who has been, uh, you know, victimizing players since that time. What are your thoughts on the Warriors release, uh, Obi? I know we're going to talk more about the meta later, but I think the Warriors of Chaos book uh, signaled a huge shift in the meta. You know, if you remember when 8th Condition came out, everybody was saying that uh, because of Steadfast and, and um, Step Up, Stepping Up or whatever it's called, that infantry ruled. You know, everybody hated Skaven because they could have so many slaves and so many ranks. And, you know, now you never really see a lots, lots of infantry. You rarely see lots of infantry. And the Warriors of Chaos book was one of the big things, um, one of the big steps we took in that direction because the Demon Prince came out, the Chimeras came out, and they said, bring your infantry, please. There's, right, they right, can't right. hurt well, us, and we will Yeah, and, and the, the thing is, uh, the, the, on your point, uh, Warriors of Chaos basically reflects the entire fast attack elite strategy of some armies, and they uh, bring it to another level. They bring it to the level level dial 11, uh, a 10 dial, you know, thing. Um, they, the Chimera for, you know, hot to trot when they first came out, I don't think we're seeing them as much. The Skull Crushers are always there. They're always going to be used. The uh, BSB on Demonic Steed or Disc, uh, that's always a, a monster to deal with. And more, most importantly, um, the Unkillable Lord on Disc and the Demon Prince. And the two Demon Prince I think we see most of is both Nurgle and the Cacophonic Spamming Slanesh Demon Prince. Right. Uh, both of those are tough cookies, especially since a lot of the armies started including faster troops to kind of react to the speed because tell you what man the movement four infantry wasn't cutting the mustard anymore and they were getting triple charged um i don't know if the game has changed but even uh i don't know if it's improved but so much uh after the words of chaos came out with the arrival of the demons of chaos demons came out in february and uh much to a lot of the demons players chagrin Everyone online and everyone was about to rage quit saying they got horrible with the Reign of Chaos table and uh, no Dispel Scroll and random magic items. And I think, I think, just maybe we can say that that those uh, concerns became unfounded. What are your thoughts? I think that, I, um, well, my impression when it first came out was it was fixed because it's still a decent book. It's, it wasn't the ridiculously overpowered book that was last time, which I'm still angry about, to be honest with you. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's a good book. Everybody was griping about it because they were used to, to putting the models on the table and just winning automatically. Um, and now I think you do have to play it well, but the winner of the, of the Southeast, Masters Invitational was Demons. Um, yeah. and I've seen him successful in a lot of, in a lot of events. Yeah, the, the Demon release, they brought the uh, Plague Drones. Um, in fact, it was, you could really call it almost a Nurgle release. It seemed like Nurgle was the uh, uh, the god rising to power in this 8th edition version for both warriors and demons of chaos. With the plague drones, but particularly the plague beasts, getting really strong. Um, they share a lore with the warriors of chaos, but until 8th edition cycles out, um, the biggest hiccup with 8th edition, of course, is the 8 lords of magic are still a little bit more powerful than all the book lures, but they still got great spells to go with it. Oh, They've sure. got um, they uh, some of the, the lower tier units like the Screamers and stuff they fixed. They uh, finally integrated um, the Soul Rider into the proper book, but most importantly, I guess, and the unit that's gotten the most noise was the Skull Cannon of Corn. Any thoughts on this unit? It's rough, man. <laughs> that's brutal. It's brutal. Um, I had 135 points. It's only 15 more points than an Empire Great Cannon. I know you're familiar with those. Um, but this thing uh, can fight if it gets a charge off, uh, you know, and it's flaming, which helps and hurts it against some unit types. But it's got a ward save. And it's about 35 points cheaper than the Ogre Blaster, the Ogre Blaster, the Iron Blaster released by the Ogres, which was deemed broken by the community as well uh, about a year and a half ago. So uh, this thing's almost improved on it, um, almost in every way. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I, 
you know what? You go back to your capitalism thing. They come out with a new a new model, they under they undercost it and overprice it, and they sell and make a lot of money. And so I think we're, I wonder if we're always just gonna have to deal with that. Um, well, I think they're making up the money they lost on the slaughter brew, <laughs> to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, after uh, and and, and the, the the kind of cap off the entire uh, invasion of the two chaos armies. Um, I guess if the wars of chaos started pushing infantry away from the meta, then demons of chaos basically put the boot in because uh, while the marauders went out for the wars of chaos, the corn blood letters went out for the demons. In came the multiple units of drones. The uh, you know, multiple units of characters mounted on mounts or flying characters or demon princes, uh, blood crushers or just, you know, plague drones, plague beasts. I mean, everything got, you know, smaller. Now, you'll still have the infamous Wall of Nurgle build, and that's a primarily, you know, two or three, even three block infantry. But even though Nurgle Wall is losing popularity from when it first came out, I think the, the more lively build is kind of gone in the direction of the horrors and the hell, uh, the blood cannons, skull cannons, yeah. and uh, that way. Yeah. Yeah. And then, I mean, not not to, to push the agenda ahead, but then it's, I see the trend continuing when the high elves came out. It was, yeah. it was, it was in some ways more of the same. Yeah, high elves uh, came out in uh, May of this year, and uh, to much fanfare, there were a lot of people that uh, said the high elf book was the most balanced release that Games Workshop had put out in recent memory. Um, and I would say it got more fanfare from the community than all the releases of this edition. Um, you know, even uh, Empire came out with a lot of static because the mortars went to crap. Um, Vampire Count players weren't happy. The Ogres were overpowered. Everyone had a problem. Tomb Kings were underpowered. But the High Elves, by the entire community, was likened to a, a well-balanced, um, a well-built uh, army. And uh, the High Elf release came out with uh, a couple of new packs. It came out with the infamous Flying Chariots. They had bolt throwers on the back, the Sky Cutter. Which, and which, got, which were popular for about two months, and now nobody takes them. Yeah, well, I think people were probably testing them out for the yeah. first two months, and then they said, okay, we can't take them. But also in the release, they get the Sisters of Aberlorn, which I have seen on the tabletop, yeah. slash uh, Shadow Warriors kit. And that's just a great kit to be in with. But, of course, the big boy in the room is the Frost Phoenix, the big Frosty. Um, that You know, there was um, another type of Phoenix, too. You, you yeah, never well, see it. Yeah, you've never seen it. It only comes in blue, you know, <laughs> but it comes in blue plastic now. They just said, forget it, you know, um, but the, the, the Frost Phoenix, that thing has been terrorizing battlefields ever since that book came out. And the interesting thing about the High Elf book, the High Elf book has always been a traditional elite army, multiple small units, things of that nature. But this new book has, in my opinion, pushed them into a more dark, uh, Death Star build. Um, all their synergies, they got a new lore magic that increased ward saves. And, and um, a lot of the most effective builds uh, at some of the largest tournaments we've seen had high elves winning it. But when they have won it, it's been like a block of 50 watt lines. What do you think? I, I think you're absolutely right. I think, I still think that with one exception, the, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful book. It's very balanced. And the exception is that it allows for abuse way too easily. Uh, so the, the Banner of the World Dragon, the synergies you talk about, the ward save stacking, those things are great when you're looking at a, an M MSU or MMU build, but you give a Death Star, and now it's it's a list that I'm certain, I'll complain about it, I don't like it. Um, you know, 50 anything, White Lines, or even Phoenix Guard, I don't care. Um, yeah, it's a hard, it's a tough nut to crack, and you can pop a character in the second rank, like the Ogre Trick, uh, or the Black Knight Death Star in the second rank with the Crown of Command, and uh, you're laughing, you yeah. know. Yeah. A high initiative to avoid the high spells. Um, e even you know, miscasts you got... don't hurt you. Even even oh, yeah, miscasts. Yeah. I mean, that's just a tough nut to crack. And uh, when you lose your best weapon to cracking that nut, the best thing you can do is try to get the uh, points around it and hope for the small win, or you're losing. Yeah. So that's my only complaint about. It. Other than that, I think it's great. I think the Frost Heart Phoenix is is obviously ridiculously good, uh, but I'm okay with that. That's that's fine. Um, yeah, I think the army, for the most part, plays the way I think it should play. They're, they're elite. They're still kind of fragile. Um, and if it weren't for abusive builds, um, you know, it makes for an interesting game. 
Yeah, and that can be said about any book. I mean, there's plenty of good builds by uh, all the armies, and uh, players that are uber competitive will generally go to the more competitive builds, at least when uh, ungoverned by some sort of comp system. And um, it, at the end of the day, is it the rules? Um, isn't the the people who write the rules uh, job to uh, um, to uh, govern how players should play, probably not. They just put out a rule set that they think would be fun, that match the models, and uh, it's really up to the players. Um, so when players kind of complain about certain army types and how they build, they shouldn't be complaining about the army designers. Those army like, designers just... The one thing they used to do that they could do, for instance, is they could say, if we have an elite unit of white, let's say white lions, put a cap on it. You remember? The, yeah. They used to have that. Black guard used to be able to take it, but only up to 20. I mean... X amount, right? Yeah, but I think I think that was more of a um, that was more of a design uh, decision from the earlier editions, like sixth. I know sixth edition had a lot of those with the Bretonian book, um, with having to take special leaders or generals to unlock certain characters, and then seventh edition kind of kept that going, but they made it where you have to select special characters like Hellborn to release the Witch Elves to core or Thrall to get the trolls. And I think now the eighth edition books came out, that largely got um, done away with. Um, and that, you know, I don't know their, uh, obviously the inner workings of the Nottingham office, but uh, the, uh, I guess the eighth edition mindset seems to be all inclusive. Bring whatever you want, buy our models, let's roll. And less more than the, uh, you know, army restrictions of that nature. Um, well, I guess that started the summer. And uh, towards the end of the summer, in August, came uh, the Jungles of Lustria's Lizardmen again. Uh, the Lizardmen released, saw a couple new kits. Uh, they saw the uh, Troglodon or the Trollalolodon, that they call it on some of the forums. The Bastilodon came out, which I think is a great model. That's more like an Acleosaurus or something. Um, and uh, aside from that, um, it was kind of more the same. Some leadership on the traditional skink cloud builds went down, with the skinks all losing one leadership. But this entire army list, uh, when it was released, it didn't change the scene, didn't change the community. They added Predatorial Fighter for the Saurus. Um, and they eliminated uh, the Slon's ability to go uh, ethereal um, without crumbling anyway. And uh, aside from those two major changes, the Lizardmen armies have remained unchanged, but the, the, the interesting part is they're no longer dominating the top tables. What are your thoughts on the changes to the Lizardman book? But most importantly, what, hasn't changed, what has changed to not make them a top-tier army anymore? Well, let me start by saying this. You know I play a lot of games, right? Yeah. I may not have played the new Lizardman book yet. And if I have, I've played it once. Okay. So the, well, I'm, that tell, what I'm saying is, I'm not, I'm not saying that to say I'm just ignorant of the book. What I'm saying is, players dropped it. They dropped it. And, and it's a shame because I think it's a, it's a well-balanced book. They have a lot of the same tools they used to. Yeah, they, yeah, they have the... Um... I'm sorry not to cut you off. They had the uh, source old uh, old ones on the coal ones. So they had the I guess the source cowboys they called them. They rocking out with three of those. The uh, slon still has access to all the lores he wants. He doesn't have lore master, but then again, or he he has the lore high elf lore master ability where he can get all the signature spells. But uh, none of the new editions have had uh, easy access to the lore master ability where they get all the spells in a certain lore. Um, but aside from that, the Skink Cloud build, um, the only thing that's really changed is the Scrox unit, where people can attack the Crossigore now instead of the Skinks. And um, I, I, you'd have to think that change was coming because that was an outdated book that they pushed into uh, the 8th edition, and they didn't think about it when they released that unit type. Um, so, of course, that was the only unit that I really saw fall from, like, 16 stories. But aside from that, the... Uh, Source on cold ones are untouched. The skinks, uh, they lost the leadership, but they're mainly untouched. Um, you know, and the slon, he retains most of his uh, power. Yeah, but he lost the ones, he lost the most popular ones. And I, I think that's why fewer people play him now. Is, um, oh, the, 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 the dominance of the magic phase is a strong point, but I would also argue um, he has an ability now where he can, uh, you know, pick up additional. Uh, 
you can channel on, on a five with you know with the channeling staff and you can channel up to three times so I think they can get some of that utility back but I don't I think it's more of an elegant uh, army design than the raw power that the uh, you know previous uh, you know focus of mystery and the previous uh, you know uh, abilities that the slime could pay for would get yeah I, I like the book I, I um the only reason I'm not starting Lizardman is because the aesthetic of the army doesn't speak to me. It's to me, I mean, it's fine for other people. For me, it's not something that I aspire to. But rules-wise and unit-wise, I would enjoy playing this with I think it's a good book. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, I guess uh, following them, now we're getting close to uh, the wintertime, and in October came the Dark Elves. Now, the Dark Elves surprised me because I was very shocked to see Games Workshop release a fifth army book in a calendar year. I don't, I mean... In recent memory, I can't remember them ever releasing more than three. Most years, they release only two, with Warhammer 40K getting the majority of the releases. But a fifth Warhammer fantasy book in one in ten months, that's average every two months, and that is ridiculous. Yeah. Um, the Dark Elves, they actually were the last man standing of the big three of 7th edition of Vampire Counts, Demons of Chaos, and the Dark Elves. They were the first book out in 7th and the last one to get switched out. Um, some uh, major changes we saw. They got a couple uh, new unit types, um, the Sisters of Slaughter being Wool Chef Alternatives, the Cauldron of Blood Changed, and it's got a new kit and a very impressive kit to boot. They got a couple new kits. They've got the, um, you know, the new Cauldron of Blood model is wonderful. I think the uh, rules took a, a little step back, but that's probably more than they needed. Uh, the two big, big releases for the Dark Elves were the Witch Elves, which got some amazing models, uh, the really motion, you know, um, jumping, dancing, uh, chicks trying to kill you. And, uh, of course, probably the uh, crown jewel of the Dark Elf release, the infamous Brolocks or the Warlocks. Uh, they share a kit with the Dark uh, Riders. They have the, uh, like, um, old 1950 Bucktooth horses that they're riding. And... Um, uh, those models are flying off the shelf, probably due to their rules. Why don't you tell us a little about uh, their rules and the entire Dark Elf release? Well, I, I, I didn't buy the book, and um, I, I've yet to play them, but I know that they, they can cast some pretty nasty magic. I don't, I don't know the name of the spell, but a direct damage spell that's pretty good, and they can oh. they can six yeah, dice it. Totally. I'm sorry? said, so, no, I, I was thinking of the high off spell, but it's a summer one, two souls quench. Yeah. But they can they can they can six dice it with immunity, because it's a bound yeah. spell. So, well, the uh, the warlocks themselves, uh, I think, clock out at twenty four points. They are uh, capped with a uh, four up board four, and two strength seven. four attacks. Um, of course, they're fast cav, and whenever they miscast, they uh, lose a D three models. And they can cast the signature spell of the Dark Lore, which is two D six strength five, or can be boosted to four D six strength five. And alternatively, they can cast um, the minus one strength, minus one toughness, lower death spell. Um, names slipped off my tongue, but it's really good. Uh, but uh, yeah, the, the, the Dark Elves came out, and um, some things, the Hydra got a huge nerf. Uh, some units like the Shades didn't really go up. Um, they didn't get any better or worse. The general cost got brought in line with the High Elves. And I think with the the Dark Elves and the High Elves and infantry not really getting the point break that uh, some of the monstrous infantry and monstrous cab and some of the new models are getting, or even like fast cab in the Dark Elf circumstance, that's a, another reason to push infantry to the side. I mean, the Dark Elf players have pretty much all but abandoned, uh, unless they're going with some sort of cauldron build with either Corsairs or Witch Elves you know, guarding this big culture in the blood, um, most of them were just going Dark Rider Cav, Silver Helm Cav for the High Elves, Reaver Cav. You know, the shame of it is for Dark Elves is their rules with, instead of having hatred, now that they just have ASF, so against most things, they're re-rolling to hit, and they re-roll ones, is it, they re-roll ones Yeah, Murder Sprouse, whereas the uh, High they got the, uh, I guess, the mirror of the High Elf ability of the Marshall Browse. Yeah. Which of course isn't a bad um, bad uh, ability at all. I've played in the Southeast Masters myself, and uh, even something strength four rerolling to wounds, the stuff starts adding up. 
Um, sure. So if you don't have a one-up save, pretty soon, you, and even if you do have a one-up save, sooner or later you have to. You, they just keep throwing dice at you until you start failing. So, yeah. Um, the, you know the Charybdis and the Dark Elf uh, Hydra were the big character release or the big monster release uh, for the Dark Elves. Um, I haven't been too impressed with either one, but I like the crew dress because it's strength seven and weapon skill five and initiative like four. Um, the hydro, the hydro is more of a more of a stay, uh, you know, uh, point and shoot weapon now. It's only 160 points, still can do a lot of damage, but it can't take a punch at all. Um, you get charged it with a couple things that are doing strength five attacks. You can really reduce its offensive output pretty quickly. Well, I would say it used to be point and shoot, and now it's it's squarely a support unit. It yeah, more like a chariot, a heavy, a heavy chariot, if you will, just a really, really heavy chariot. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, I guess with all those army books out, I wasn't really expecting anything else to be released for Games Workshop's fantasy calendar. Now, if we were discussing, or if we were a 40k channel, uh, this is probably just run of the mill, you know, every year with eight or nine releases. But um, fantasy, they really capped it off this year by two, uh, I guess, two. Uh, tosses out to the fantasy, the garage, the hobby players. The first one being um, Triumph and Treachery, which it turned out to be a rule set, however, at $85, for a multiplayer Warhammer. Now, where this uh, separates from just like three dudes hanging out in the garage is there's rule sets and, um, in this instance, little plastic tokens to represent gold pieces that uh, the side who accumulates the most of these gold pieces wins and they have cards that can affect other people so say you and i were playing and one of our club mates uh has a chat uh has a, a charge on either one of us we can kind of bribe him and play cards to maybe make his troops stay out of combat and then you know bribe each other and you know it's kind of cut through it almost like a multiplayer magic the gathering style you know you get my back i got your back uh you know we're all enemies type deal sounds really interesting uh, sounds like a lot of fun and you know what on club nights when only an odd number of people show up which happens all the time up here it could be worth the purchase but for 85 dollars uh i don't know that's kind of pricey what do you think well i know where i where i live um the thought was that everybody pitch in a few bucks we, we get a, a club copy and yeah, it's not my club per se, but you know, get a, a copy for the group, and then they use it whenever they use it. And even then, people didn't really step up. Um, I think it's a good idea. The thing is, I don't like games like that. I don't, I don't mind team games, uh, but even uh, board games like uh, like Shogun, you know, the board games uh, that where it's everybody against each other and you have temporary alliances. Uh, I find that sometimes. Um, bad feelings result when uh, you get stabbed in the back? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I certainly think um, it's a game for uh, the pure beer and pretzels aspect. I mean, it, it's certainly something where you're just hanging out with the guys. Um, and uh, honestly, it's a break from a lot of the uh, testing for tournaments. A lot When you, when you just want to unwind and play some Warhammer, because uh, let's face it, it is a huge investment. Um, with the amount of time we all have put into modeling, purchasing, and everything else, um, and then you can't get a game in because there's an odd number of players, it might be an alternative. I mean, the, the price is kind of steep, um, and uh, but you know what? I'd rather them put out material for the Warhammer fantasy side than keep producing uh, another Space Marine chapter. Um, well, I, I would rather them, and this goes with Sigmar's Blood as well, but I would rather them continue putting supplements out than to keep pace with the army books. I don't want five army books next year. It's it's too much, like um, too much change. I like army books to stay around for a little while, uh, assuming they're done well. Uh, so I like stuff like this. You know, let's build a, a greater variety of types of games that can be played. Yeah. No. Well, and uh, the final one uh, closed out 2013 was this month with the release of Sigmar's Blood. It's a campaign pack, uh, and it's a narrative campaign of like four or five uh, battles you can play that uh, pits Manfred Van Barn Karstein and the uh, Vampire Hordes against the Empire um, in the if Vampire and Empire history in their uh, fluff sections of their uh, army books. Obviously. You need the armies and the army books to even use it, um, goes without saying. But, you know, it kind of brings me back to those uh, days in the late 90s. I don't know if you were playing when they had the Circle of Blood and uh, some of the other campaign packs they put out. Now, um, I don't know exactly the price point on this one. Uh, the previous co campaign packs 
came with like terrain to uh, go with the campaign to kind of get the two players in the mood. But I'm always interested in narrative type campaigns. And in fact, we have two clubmates of ours that are currently playing this. Um, again, I think it's a great addition to the hobby side of things. And it's kind of like a, a, a lime sorbet after a big meal uh, of, you know, army books after army books after army books. And uh, kind of, a, you know, a, a, a something good to end the year with, better than, again, something round based related. Yeah. And it was kind of a surprise. I, I didn't I, I didn't expect it to come out, and then I just saw it. You know, so. I didn't hear about it myself. I didn't. I think again, like you, I'm not a real big war seer or um, rumor mill type of guy. Um, but uh, when our clubmates actually told me they were playing it out, I thought it was one of those um, iPad versions that they're releasing now on their digital media. Um, I guess actually that wasn't the final release. One of the final releases was also released this month. It was the digital version of the Warhammer 8th Edition rulebook. Um, now I don't know if this went full iPad, like uh, the digital copies for art, the army books where you can put the quick links and you can hit a unit type and it's full, uh, you know, a, a full digital copy um, that'll have all the amended, uh, you know, rules that they change actually in the book, or if it's just uh, a massive PDF that they want to charge you 40 bucks for. But uh, at the end of the day, I have the actual rule book, so uh, you know, I didn't really feel the need to purchase the online I, version. I hadn't heard about that. I, I find that interesting. If ninth edition is coming out, well, let's say ninth. It doesn't cost them. It doesn't cost them any money. It's a digital copy. But they're selling you know? something that they know has a very short shelf life. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, so you you put it out, people buy it. Mm, you know, now I mean, it would please me if ninth edition was off at least one more year. Um, because the rumors from 2014 are looking pretty good. But I guess uh, before we get on that, let's take another break and right. hear from all of our sponsors, and we'll be right All right, and we're back. Let's finish it up with some closing thoughts. Uh, 2013 year in review, that's a wrap. Lots of Army books released, a lot of new unit types entering the game. You spoke about meta. Once been, what do you think how these new units affected the meta, particularly on the tournament scene and maybe just in general? Uh, you brought up a couple instances as we went along, so go ahead. Uh, well, I would say at the moment the, the meta is that uh, infantry is taking a, a back seat right now. You, you really, when I go to tournaments, I see very few armies with large blocks of infantry. Um, which, again, I, I find that ironic mainly because that was the issue when 8th edition came out, is what are you going to do about infantry? The one cap, what I see in the meta, though, is when you do see infantry, they're all in predominantly one unit in a Death Star uh, that in some way or another is perceived to be unkillable, unbreakable, or something like that. So the current meta I see is infantry not being used except for the most part in Death Stars. And this is not true all the, all the time, of course, but anyway. I see a, um, a lot of very fast-moving armies. So you see a lot of armies where everything is mounted, where they're going to hit hard and fast and with a great armor save. And you notice they're not worried about steadfast because they don't care because their opponents are going to be steadfast for a turn or two max because nobody's bringing that much infantry. And third, I'm seeing a lot more varieties of Monster Mash slash Flying Circus. Um, but the nice thing about that is when I go to tournaments, I'm actually seeing a pretty wide variety of that stuff. I, uh, with one exception, one tournament this year, with, with that exception, you don't see only Death Stars or only Monster Mash or only All Cav. Um, but you're seeing a variety of those things. My biggest complaint about the meta, and then I'll sign off for a second, is that um, 
I think with the way the rules are, it, it's really encouraging Death Stars. And I, I, I think that style of game is fun a couple of times and then kind of gets old. Yeah. Well, I, I think Death Stars are coming more than they were in early 8th because uh, unit types, they're getting, they have to put on the heavy armor to compete. Um, they're, uh, you know, the, the infantry, like it's starting so far back as the Vampire Count release. When the Vampire Counts, when their Grave Guard and Ghouls went away from being a primary combat arm to a secondary combat arm and the Black Knight bus becoming one of the stronger builds for the VC, um, that became the start of the demise of the infantry. And as releases have come out, um, with the Warriors of Chaos and the Marauder Hordes going bye bye because their prices doubled, the Blood Letters going up in cost but getting worse, uh, sure, people are uh, substituting Plague Bearers, but you'll see a lot of the infantry armors. Uh, infantry armory armies lose their their top uh, spot on the totem. Like Skaven are a perfect example. In 2011, the Skaven and the Ogre Kings were kingdoms were the, the undisputed one and two armies. Um, as they've come along, Skaven a lot of their tricks they just can't handle the speed. I mean those it's the the funny thing is these demon princes, these flying characters, these characters moving up demonic mounts, these uh, just flying phoenixes or chimeras or whatever. They get into combat and they're safe in close combat. And the Skaven can't score points. As, uh, you know, the infantry armies, that's where they don't want to be. So uh, then when you couple that with, um, you know, uh, no, no price deductions, price deductions, but on the cavalry side, like with the Warlocks only being 25 points, the Dragon Prince is getting better, but only going up one point. The, the Monstrous Cap still being undercosted across the board with the Skull Crushers, although the Skull Crushers did get a bump from where they were put out in the White Dwarf release. Um, the thing is, is Spearman at nine points a model, I don't care if you're a High Elf or a Dark Elf, I mean, that's not gonna cut it for, you know, I mean, one one uh, Demigriff Knight is worth six Spearmen points-wise, but it could probably do a hell of a lot more than six Spearmen in the battle. Right. And that's part of the problem, um, you know. And I, I don't know if it's gonna change. It feels kind of like a pseudo seventh edition. Whereas the fast, highly mobile, heavy, hard-hitting troops, rather than break you on the initial charge, they rather hit you in a, a point of their choosing and then grind you in one or two turns. So it's the same exact result. Yep. Um, and it's kind of it, it, it kind of like all the great attributes I dug about eighth, with infantry actually being a viable combat arm, have now been dissolved and stripped away. And I would like to see um, Games Workshop do something to rectify that because I'm an infantry guy. You know, I've never been a real cavalry guy, monster guy. I like infantry. I like boots on the ground. Yeah. No, I agree um, with that. And they charge in, and not only are they not worried about taking a couple turns to, to break their steadfast, but like you mentioned before, they're safe in combat because you can't hurt them. Um, yeah. For the most part. You know, you need five or sixes to wound, and they've got a one-up save, and, you know, who cares? So, um <laughs> <laughs> and you've got these 11-point uh, greatswords, and they're just like flailing around. Yeah, it's terrible. You know, when I once I took greatswords out of my army, replaced them even with halberdiers, because I get two blocks, two big blocks of halberdiers. I still run some some troops, but not. Remember when 25 was a big unit in seventh? Yeah, 25 yeah. is just a waste of points on the table. <laughs> yeah, you gotta have. Like, well, I mean, to be honest with you, uh, you know, 40 isn't enough. And, and the weird thing is, is like at the Southeast Masters. I'll have a big block of like 40 men at arms and I'll be afraid to commit. <laughs> I've got 40 of these guys and I'm like, Oh, I don't want to commit because you know, once they get in, they're just, okay, you hold them up for a turn or two, however long you can hold them up for while the rest of us try to do our job. And if the other, um, branches of the military or so to speak, or if the other, uh, you know, dedicated, uh, attack parts of your army don't do their job or do it quick enough, that infantry is rolling over. And that's kind of a, that's that's the the one thing I lament about uh, the direction it went, and I hope um, I hope they find some way to bring it back. And with the dwarves rumored uh, being a good segue into 2014, with the dwarves rumored to be hitting in February, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I mean, I know five army books in a year. Now we're looking at maybe number six in the early spring. What do you think? Well, here here's what I think. I think. I don't, I'm not predicting they will. I think what they need to do is get the Dwarf book out, get the Wood Elf book out, get the damn Bretonian book out, and then yeah. take a breath. Take a breather. They're, they're all... Sell the company. Sell the company that has... Sell the company. Yeah. Um, sell the company. 
yeah, I, they, they need to do those things. Um, I think they just need them and, and, and to do them well, make it to where they can, they can compete. You know, one thing, um, and I'm speaking to this point, but it's, I'm going back just a little bit. You know, one thing we, we're not saying about the meta, how often now do you show up to a game where the person is obviously planning to win it through magic alone or through shooting alone? I don't, I well, don't see it. I mean, some armies are still built like that. Um, um, like the cacophonic uh, armies, the really hard, fast, hard-hitting uh, slanesh armies, um, they can kind of make all your troops go haywire. They can, they're really good against... They're, I guess maybe why they're so good is because they're good against the meta with the no armor save, wounding on fours, and small unit types, you, you run out there with some skull crushers or something, they just pop. Um, you know, uh, so are there some armies that need to kind of rely on it or have that really good uh, ace in the hole? Um, but compared to the days of Mind Ranger, and you really don't see a lot of Lore Shadow anymore, and I was a big Lore Shadow fan. Um, you know, uh, Purple Sun, uh, Lore Death is probably, Lore Death and Lore of Light are probably where Shadow and Death or Shadow and Light have had, or Shadow and Life have had their time in the sun in early 8th. Now I think it's really about Lore Light for the guys who can make councils and Lore Death for anyone else who can get it. Yeah, yeah, you I wouldn't disagree with that. Um, so I guess speaking in the metagame, um, and I guess kind of closing out, uh, this year has also been pretty good, um, and this is more U.S. Uh, centric, but the U.S. Commu community, um, it's never been uh, more, uh, uh, it's, it's never been uh, more conducive to uh, new players than it's ever been. I mean, I know uh, just a couple of years ago in uh, the Mid-Atlantic and the Southeast, uh, there were maybe one or two tournaments around, and uh, through uh, some hard work on some of the regional organizers, we kind of pushed the agenda forward. And uh, now we're kind of leading the way to the national scene. And now there's even a, a, a master circuit nationally that uh, starts in two, February 2014 is when it drops. Um, and on top of that, we've got six tournaments lined up for the southeast region, which is you know Maryland all the way down to Georgia, uh, six grand tournaments in one calendar year where, what, just – Two years ago, we had one, maybe two. What are your thoughts on that? I think that you're not taking nearly enough credit for that. Um, I don't know if the viewers appreciate this or not, but, but Jerry lives on forums promoting this stuff and has done a lot of organization. Uh, I think it's a great time to be Warhammer in the United States especially. I can't speak to the UK or other countries because I just don't know. But here in the U.S., um, there's a lot of these tournaments that really get people excited about the game. Um, it's not about just the, the win-at-all-cost players that are looking to win the tournament. These tournaments are getting 60, 80, sometimes 100 players, and people want to come up. They want, they want to meet other players. They like the energy in the field when you see all these beautifully painted armies. And the, the more GTs we have, and then when we connect them and having GTs that lead to invitational tournaments, and then we, we uh, are connecting with people across the country so we're not so isolated in our own little silos in the southeast or in California or wherever, um, I think... Uh, we're we're going to see a real boom in the Warhammer Fantasy community, yeah. unless and, Games Workshop screws it up somehow. Yeah, well, uh, and I and I think um, this is uh, in particular a project I've worked on for the past uh, since 2009 at least with the uh, original rankings website. Um, but uh, the good thing is, is uh, someone like yourself um, can go to uh, the new forms that we've put up for the United States Warhammer, which is a War Gamers USA. Um, and uh, you'll see people from Ohio who made the National Masters. They're coming on down that went to Buckeye. You know, so wherever you are in the country, you've got a, a, a central portal you can go to, find a grand tournament, or ask on the forums if no one knows. Now, we're still in the infancy stages. We're still growing. Um, you know, we, uh, the, the website's only been live for about three or four months, but um, the community's gathering around it, I think, with... Um, the, the the website being the home of the masters and all we, we in fact good news is we just had a sixth region join um, which will be the deep south so the region you and I will play in or play in now we're moving from the southeast and we're getting renamed the mid Atlantic that change happened this week it's probably more and accurate deep, anyway yeah yeah and the deep south now is um, or the southeast what we're calling them are uh, you know Georgia Alabama. Mississippi, Tennessee, um, and, and they're starting, and they start with their inaugural three events, 
of course, the minimum to have a legion. And uh, they've got uh, led by uh, David Reed, who runs the Redstone Rumble in Huntsville, Alabama. So they've got um, they've got some good things cooking up there. Now it's just a matter of time before the holes, the blank spots on the country map are filled in, like the Pacific Northwest. Um, whether or not the Ohio Valley will have enough uh, um, enough events to succeed from the Midwest, or if they want to stick around, um, we're going to really try to make it. Uh, like I said, inclusive, man. If we can get anyone who wants to play wherever, that's just best for all of us. Because you know what? Um, Warhammer Fantasy has always been more of a fringe, redhead stepchild to Warhammer 40K. So if uh, I've moved for my career a couple times, I know you've moved. Um, how nice would it be to move to a new place, have a central place where you can meet everybody, and then know eventually you can even play some of your old opponents on a greater stage at a later date. You know, so it, it's kind of like an interconnected thing, and I think that can't be anything but good for the community. And it, it all kicked off this year, and uh, the first Masters will be next year. And that's, I think, after the first conclusion of the very first Masters, once everyone can put a face with a name, everyone gets comfortable, I think that's when it really, really launches off, you know. And I think that's when we'll see some significant growth. And then we can have a more close-knit community like some of the other countries that you see. Yeah, no, I, th I think so, too. I think... Um... Yeah, I think it's an exciting time, and we'll make sure to put a link into the for the website that you're talking about. We'll uh, we'll put a link. Yeah, wargamersusa.com, and if you want to follow uh, us on Twitter, you can uh, follow us underscore wfb underscore uh, masters, and uh, that uh, at whatever at start that off with. Um, All right, so well, New Year's resolution. What you got? Yeah, New, New Year's resolution for myself. Um, it's kind of a tough one. I was uh, starting another army again, and um, the army I selected was Tomb Kings. Um, and uh, I think my resolution has to be one of two things. Uh, last year, my resolution was for each tar each tournament to bring a different army. And I did well. I finished uh, number five in our region or number six in our region uh, uh, before crashing and burning at the Masters. Um, but that's another story. Uh, this year, I think um, I, I, I think I'm going to go with uh, bringing armies to consecutive grand tournaments because I did notice my switching on and off armies it allowed me to be experienced with almost every army I run into. But then, um, just like the Masters, there's just simple things I, I couldn't keep up with myself on certain things and certain tricks for each army, like trebuchet shooting and stuff like that, that you know that you've played with but because you've been switching on and off armies you just you know it doesn't occur to you and then you're like oh jesus you know um so i, I think i might bring two consecutive armies um uh or my goal will to be actually fielding a hard as balls army uh you know um and i think you already flipped that switch um and you know notice that's the direction of our local meta going and uh, for me, that's still a big pill to take. I mean, I like fielding my Empire Army of Handgunners and Lore Heavens and I just, uh, you know, Lore Master High Elves and Tomb Kings. I, I like um, I like it being my army. And there's something to be said about having an army that you design from the ground up. No, but I mean, it just does not have the raw, raw horsepower that some of the internet builds have. And, uh, you know, those would be my two major ones. And then a third one. So I'm kind of on the fence. I don't really have uh, one. I have three. I, mean, I haven't decided on it. Maybe next episode I'll be able to reveal which one I picked. My third one is um, I push out a lot of armies. I've probably painted six armies in the past 24 months. Uh, some of our clubmates like Lord Inquisitor have pushed me to, you know, get one really, really focused army. And instead of pushing out you know, two armies in six months, do one army for a year and see how well I can make that army. To be honest with you, um, I think my ADD would just drive me crazy and I'd get bored with the project because I can't work on an army that much because I like change. Um, so, so I don't know. Those are uh, the three I'm kind of deciding on. Not exactly set. What about you? Well, I decided yesterday that the, the army I'm going to start building in 2014 is Tomb Kings. Oh, Nice. Uh, Maybe we can record our stories together. Yeah, there, there's a, uh, a YouTube subscriber that actually emailed me and volunteered to, to custom make and paint a centerpiece model for the army. So he's going to do a hiro titan for me. And that was, all, that's the, that was the final straw, the inspiration I needed. 
So I can use that as a base and I can create and build my army and paint it around that. And it gets me excited about something again. Um, well, I, well, I'm not committing to take that to the tournaments yet. I'm really enjoying my, my light council build or just empire in general, because at least I feel that the tools are available for however I, whatever I feel I need to counter the current meta. Um, whereas I think with Bretonians or Beastmen, I think I would get frustrated going to tournaments. I think they just, I'm not sure they have the tools, the wide variety of tools that I feel I need. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe that's well. Just... I mean, if that, if that's the way you feel about Bretonians and Beastmen, um, you are certainly a glutton for punishment. Rocking into Tomb Kings, I've uh, gotten the initial stages of my army started, and um, there's just gaping, gaping weaknesses. Uh, and I've actually started a thread on the War Gamers USA forum, uh, how I would fix the Tomb Kings. That's the name of it, and I listed some bullet points. That I think uh, with the with the rules of the game being you can't change the points of the unit, um, so you have to work it within the points. Obviously, nothing really silly, but um, you'll you'll notice some deficiencies there. Now, was it uh, if I may ask, was it the Egyptian theme that got you, or what? What's what are you really going with? Um, I don't know. I've always liked them. I like, I've always liked the thought of Tomb Kings in, in VC um, as an army. Um, I'm not painting it like Games Workshop is, just because I've decided just to try not to do that. Uh, so it's not going to be like the turquoise and blue look. Um, but, you know, we'll see. I, I, I like, I, I'm going into it liking the idea of a monster mash, but I'm holding off on committing to that because I need to see... Well, if you see me play armies, I, they evolve, and I, I just play test them. And I find... I mean, I, I could be fooling myself on this, but it seems to me that... When I play armies, I, I play around with a lot of different builds, and I get to a place where I have a list that really works for me, but it's not typical. It's not the kind of list that most people use when they use that army. Mm -hmm. um, right. And I could be wrong on that, but like even my Light Council build, um, I don't, I'm not sure it's a typical Light Council build. If nothing else, just because of the two hordes of halberdiers. Um, yeah. yeah. So I don't know. I, I, I you don't have enough one up armor knights in it. Yeah, yeah. Or, or the Capticists. You know, I think that's a, uh, you know, the Capticis and the one of Armor Knights, I think, are what you're missing from the traditional build. I put Capticis back in, but he's he's my, he's my concession. Because if it wasn't for that, I'd take him out. I'd, I'd take out a couple small things. I'd put a second unit of Demigriffs. <laughs> those things are awesome. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess he is a concession if you put it like that. But that's, you know, that's, uh, see, but the thing is, I tell you what, man, I don't, um, that, type, that style of play doesn't interest me. I need... I, I kind of need to do my own thing, and um, I think it'll be interesting to see, uh, you know, the uh, evolution of both of our lists. Um, and uh, see, I'm I'm going a totally different way right now. The standard Tomb King army is Council of Light, just like your Empire build, and I'm going uh, Nakara all the way. Um, I'm not doing Monster Mash, but I'm going to try to abuse the Entomb rule. So uh, yeah. already, you and I have two uh, divergent paths from the uh, standard accepted. And you know what? Maybe that is the best model for the army. But you know what? I'll be damned if I'm playing some White Council. If I was going to do it, I'd do it for Empire. <laughs> you know, I'm not doing it with Tomb Kings. So, uh, you know, whether that turns out to be good or not, we'll see. But, I mean, it, it'll certainly be fun for 2014's project anyway. Yeah. And, hey, um, you, you actually alluded to this earlier, but we never talked about it. So why don't we end on this? Uh, this 2013 year in review is actually a precursor to a month in review series that Jerry P and I are planning on doing uh, once a month, uh, capturing the news and happenings of the Warhammer Fantasy Battles community. Uh, so uh, this is in some ways an inaugural event. Um, yeah, yeah. I think we're going to. Uh, I don't. I don't. I'm not too sure on the topic we decided for the January, but I know we're coming in real strong in February. We've got a lot of good podcasting hosts. Uh, lined up um, for the U.S. Masters coverage. Uh, we'll be releasing all the matchups live, um, or I guess pre-recorded, on this channel, and that's the only way they'll be able to get their matchups. And uh, we'll be doing round-by-round uh, -round coverage uh, at the event. Maybe not me, maybe, uh, you know, the star of the show once bitten and someone else, but uh, as I'll be running the event. But uh, we're certainly here to, um, you know, just... Uh, uh, do our little bit to help the community and to uh, kind of uh, grow this tapestry that a lot of the other players from around the world have already 
started to grow, all the podcasters, all the other YouTube battle reporters, all the bloggers. And uh, I think we're just going to do our little bit to kind of jump in there and help out. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, hey, let's call it at that. And, um, you know, thanks for watching. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in, guys.